Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Apologies for starting a little bit late. The last session uh, ran over. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, this is the panel titled Tackling Internet Disruptions via Multi-Stakeholder Advocacy. My name is Daniel O'Malley and I'm here representing the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative, um, which has co-sponsored this panel along with the Global Network Initiative, uh, who is being represented by my co-moderator, David Sullivan, who's all the way at the end of the platform there. Um, and, uh, you know, given that the Open Internet for Democracy Initiative is actually a joint project of my organization, the Center for International Media Assistance, the National Democratic Institute, and the Center for International Private Enterprise, and given that GNI is actually also a multi-stakeholder organization that uh, has representation from tech companies and from civil society, we can, we can genuinely say that this is truly a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, panel and really lives up to the IGF ide ideal. Um, I want to uh, start off talking about you know, some of the numbers. According to Access Now, in 2017, there were a total of 108 internet shutdowns. That's in the entire year. Now, in just the first six months of 2018, there were 81. So we're seeing an increase. The problem appears to be getting worse, not better. Um, and one of the, the worst examples was in the Anglophone regions in Cameroon, where between January uh, 2017 and March 2018, the internet was shut down for a total of 230 days. So that's almost 60% of a year. Um, and uh, this is very, very uh, dire situation for the people who live in that region. But what we're here talking uh, today is about more than just shutdowns, uh, because uh, while a shutdown is it's the most severe form of an internet disruption, we're seeing that governments are increasingly using other, uh, more subtle techniques to, uh, to disrupt the flow of information on the internet. That can be anything from a very specific shutdown uh, in a, uh, localized in a specific neighborhood even, but it can also be blocking traffic, uh, internet traffic to certain websites uh, or platforms. It can be throttling traffic so that you're slowing traffic so that you can't share images and video, for example. Um, so these types of disruptions, which we're also going to be talking about, are oftentimes more subtle and therefore even more per pernicious because we don't even necessarily, the people who are suffering them don't necessarily know that they're happening. Um, now, one thing to highlight when we talk about internet disruptions is we often associate internet disruptions with authoritarian regimes, right? Governments that are shutting down the internet uh, for political purposes uh, to protect their, the power. But we also have seen internet disruptions in democracies. The, the shutdown tracker of the Software Freedom Law Center, for example, which is based in India, has um, noted 124 shutdowns and disruptions um, in 2018 already in India, the world's largest democracy. So I just want to put that out there that what we're talking about really is a global issue that is affecting countries everywhere. Um, and, and one of the issues with internet disruptions is that they have negative, obviously negative impacts on society because they, they block the flow of uh, free news and information. This is so what we're seeing, especially around election times when these types of disrup disruptions are occurring. They uh, disrupt the ability of citizens to express themselves, to assemble online. Uh, they hinder the ability of companies to conduct business, and so they affect GDP. This is especially true with small and medium enterprises that sometimes, well, that oftentimes rely on social messaging apps or, or uh, social messaging platforms to conduct business, and that's impossible when you have these types of disruptions. And they also uh, uh, really challenge uh, uh, strategic infrastructure, education, healthcare systems. So they have a wide variety of um, impacts across society. And this is really why these types of internet shutdowns uh, violate uh, some of the principles that organizations like the GNI uh, and the Open Internet for Democracy uh, support. You know, uh, we have uh, the, the democratic principles for an open internet, which is the guiding document of the Open Internet for Democracy initiative. And the GNI has its own uh, principles, which the companies that uh, sign on to the initiative must live up to, and, and these are very much in opposition to those. Um, and so uh, on this panel, we're not going to be talking about numbers and tracking. There are great organizations that are doing that, like Access Now, NetBlocks, Uni, 
um, the, uh, the Software Freedom Law Center uh, in India. Uh, instead, we're going to be talking about, you know, this is a, a challenge that's getting worse. What can we do from a multi-stakeholder perspective to do something about it? We know that it's happening. What can we do? And really, uh, digital rights organizations have been doing a lot in this area, but they can't do it alone. Um, so we need to, to broaden the conversation. How do we get uh, social media and technology platforms and telecommunications companies who are often the primary you know, way that people are accessing the internet, how do, we, uh, help, uh, how do they help uh, inoculate users from these types of disruptions? What mechanisms possibly for enforcement or sanctions uh, would uh, international bodies or internet governance processes have to pressure governments to keep the internet open and accessible? Um, so th these are some of the questions that we want to talk about in the panel today. And we have an excellent panel. Um, the format of uh, this is going to be each, uh, each participant is going to briefly introduce themselves, their organization, and their work. Uh, and then we're going to have a, a, a quick roundtable discussion among the panelists that I'll moderate with David. And then we'll throw uh, the session open to the public and we'll have questions from you. So be prepared uh, with the questions that you want to ask. Now, uh, the I would like to, first of all, we have a special uh, speaker actually from uh, who is going to be participating remotely from Cameroon. Uh, she's from one of the regions where the internet shutdown has, has taken place, Kathleen Dongmo, um, who is an entrepreneur from, uh, from Cameroon. So I am going to see if the remote participation is working and hand it over to Kathleen. She was online just uh, before we started, so. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, th th I hope this isn't a disruption. Uh, we may be facing one at this moment. So what we're going to do while we're waiting to see if, um, she, if we can get her back. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, so while we wait, I'm going to actually ask Usama to uh, introduce herself, and then we'll come back to Kathleen at the end, and hopefully she'll be back online by then. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, I'm Usama Khilji. Oh, I think she's there. <laughs> Kathleen, can you hear us? You're on mute. We can't hear you. We, st we still can't hear you. Yeah, she's, um, <laughs> okay, so we're going to have to go on, we're going to have to move to Us Usama while we try and figure out how to get the audio to play from Kathleen, but we'll try and come back to you, okay? Uh, thank you, my, I'm Usama Khilji, thank you for organizing this very important session because um, I represent Bolo B, uh, which is an organization in, based in Pakistan. We focus on policy and advocacy and research uh, around digital rights, internet policy, and freedom of expression. Um, and just net, I just wanted to talk about network, uh, network shutdowns in a sense that it's largely been normalized in a lot of societies. So for example, each time there is, a, say, a public holiday or any political rally or a protest, it's very normal for you know, the Minister of Information or the Minister of Interior to announce that, oh, okay, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. tomorrow, there will be a network shutdown in these cities, in this area. You will not have mobile phone signals or you know, data connectivity. Um, so in that sense, I think it points to a larger problem of just uh, discomfort with technology and just with viewing technology as something that is new but also something that's easy to control and censor in the old school ways of, you know, dictatorships or say like monarchies. And just like you mentioned, it's Pakistan itself is a democratic country. We've had, uh, you know, transitions of democratic governments for the past more than a decade now. Uh, after bouts of military dictatorships. But despite that, the, 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 use, the post 9-11 uh, use of security in order to justify you know, trampling of rights and this whole like, global trend of um, what I would call making rights the you know, collateral damage of security has really been normalized. 
Um, and I think in that sense, uh, obviously just civil society groups or just, uh, just a few, you know, government group, uh, sorry, uh, companies cannot really make a difference. But what's really important is to like work on advocacy that changes this thinking and approach towards technology. So for example, um, I'd like to just break this down in three different points. So first of all, just the principle of it. Secondly, I'll talk about the economic impact. And thirdly, just whether it's effective or not. And I think just uh, pure research and evidence-based advocacy is what we really need. So for example, when we talk about the principle of it is whether uh, is it okay or is it proportional, uh, really proportionate to violate the fundamental rights of say access to information and freedom of expression when we shut down networks. Um, so for example, the Pakistani constitution guarantees freedom of, uh, of speech and the right to information, right? But when we have a network shut down, all of that is you know, blocked. But then secondly, when we talk about the economic impact of this is just again going back to the new use of technology is how so many businesses and so many startups rely on technology so for example uh, pakistani students and pakistani say like people who are struggling with work in the middle with fictional unemployment uh, Kareem and Uber ride hailing apps are a huge, huge you know, source of income and convenience to both citizens and to those who are looking for employment. But when you have a network shutdown, you have a shutdown of all Uber services, you have a shutdown of all Kareem services. So those people are not able to go ahead and earn and people are not able to move around, those especially who can't afford um, uh, you know, owning a car. And then lastly, whether or not this is really effective or not. So first of all, I think uh, there's very little evidence as to whether using network shutdowns for security purposes during sensitive times, what is the evidence uh, that this is really an effective way of securing citizens? Because that's the excuse that's used. But then secondly, also, uh, how this is so counterproductive, because if you're trying to quell a small protest and you're shutting down networks, you're bringing in more attention to it. And what you're doing is you're also creating a sense of panic amongst the public when they can't communicate easily or when they cannot get in touch with you know, family or friends, et cetera, that may be out. So what you really end up doing is uh, causing more d discomfort and maybe the people that you're trying to silence, in effect, you're amplifying their voice and amplifying the nuisance that they're trying to create through the protests that they're organizing, right? By government sanctioned network shutdown due to that protest being called in that area. Uh, so just talking about principles, uh, economic impact, and practicality, I think uh, this sort of like conversation and nuanced interventions from civil society and companies is very important to communicate to the government in order to you know, deal with network shutdowns. Great, thank you. Patrick? Thank you very much. My name is Patrick Hiselius. I'm a lawyer at Telia Company, which is a telco in the Nordic and the Baltics. I'm also a board member of the Global Network uh, Initiatives. Uh, I work a lot with principles within my company, but I also work with tools. So transparency reports, a tool for our stakeholders to see what type of requests we get. I work with human rights impact assessments, uh, and I work with, uh, within the GNI, I've contributed to the work of a one-pager on the arguments exactly against uh, network shutdowns. So I will talk more about that. But I'll start talking about a form, uh, uh, a form to fill in for my colleagues in local companies when they receive what we call unconventional requests. Because then uh, um, uh, the company needs to decide uh, and assess uh, wh what this uh, not only if the request from the government is legal or not, but if there is a freedom of expression implication, how to interpret the request more narrowly, if there are business uh, implication, if there is risks to personnel, to health and safety, and then how to, deal, how to do leverage. And uh, one way of doing leverage, again, is to be a member of the Global Network Initiative where we have joint interests with other companies, with NGOs, academics, and investors to push back when, uh, when there are such un unconventional requests as to uh, network shutdowns. And what we have done, Telia Company, is to publish this form, this form for assessments of requests 
and then escalation within uh, our company. So that form is available on our homepage. Going back to uh, one of the other tools is this one pager published by um, uh, the GNI on the GNI homepage. So companies and as well as governments consists of people. And people are lazy. Uh, we need checklists, right? Uh, tools. So at the GNI session at another IGF in Guadalajara in, in Mexico, there was a brainstorming. What can we do to provide, in very simple words, all of these good arguments against network shutdowns? So maybe there is someone in the vicinity of the person who takes the decision to shut down the network who has these good arguments available uh, and can hand it over or has studied them and can explain them to the decision maker. So in addition, of course, we all have these long reports from, from the UN, uh, we have the UN guiding principles, of course. Uh, we have thorough reports from SHIFT and from BSR and from the Council of Europe. We have the splendid reports from uh, David Kay. But these reports will not be read at the, at the moment of truth when someone is to take a decision within an hour or less to shut down or not. So that's why we published this uh, one page here, and it's available in, I think, nine languages. Uh, Amharic, Arabic, Bengali, Chinese, English, Farsi, French, Hindi, Portuguese, Russian, Spanish, and Turkish. So the idea is that this one page should be available at arm length. So if all of us, uh, going away from this uh, IGF, uh, can think about where to make this one pager available at arm length, where an internet uh, shutdown decision could be made, that might be a, a, a way forward to use this tool. Thanks. Great, thank you, Patrick. Ashna? Um, thank you, Dania. Um, so, my name is Ashna Kalemera. I work with CEPESA, which is uh, the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. We're based out of Kampala in Uganda. Um, so, with regards to internet disruptions and multi-stakeholder approach to push back against them, uh, it's important to understand what the African ICT or internet ecosystem is like. Um, approximately, slightly less than a quarter of the population has access to the internet. Uh, there are more mobile money accounts than bank accounts, which is extremely significant when we, it comes to uh, financial inclusion. Uh, for mobile telecom operators and ISPs, um, about 20 to 40 percent of their uh, top line is from data revenue. Uh, the sector is contributing significantly to GDP in terms of taxes and employment. Uh, for SMEs, like Daniel mentioned, it's fueling competitiveness, efficiency, and reduced transaction costs. Um, and for the informal sector, it's also supporting casual jobs, again, like Daniel said. And, and from a human rights perspective, uh, it's significant for democracy, good governance, and social accountability, as well as transparency. But of the numerous statistics that Daniel has shared, I'm sure Africa is uh, leading in terms of being the one that's uh, disrupting or shutting down the internet, uh, as it's doing traditionally in terms of clamping down and CSOs and uh, critical voices, uh, shutting them down. Uh, the disruptions that we've seen on the continent are varied. I think the only common denominator is that they're around elections or protests and exams. But uh, their approach and scope and style is different. Uh, some have been complete social media shutdowns, uh, no access to Facebook or Twitter or WhatsApp. Uh, there's been shutdowns of the entire internet in its entirety, uh, SMS-based shutdowns, uh, mobile money shutdowns. Uh, these have been countrywide, affecting entire populations. Uh, in the case of Cameroon, it was regional, again, as was mentioned earlier on. Uh, in Gabon, uh, the disruptions were curfew-based. So internet was available at certain, certain times of the day and then shut down uh, in, uh, later on. So for us at CIPESA, um, as part of our wider work for ICT policy and uh, practice that's progressive and inclusive, we recognize that uh, beyond the human rights impact of these disruptions, there are social and economic impacts. Uh, and uh, these are not demonstrated or documented as much as they should given the significance of the sector, like I mentioned earlier on. So last year, 
Uh, we worked on a framework for calculating the cost of disruptions from a sub-Saharan uh, perspective. There were previous reports by Deloitte and uh, Brookings, uh, but they didn't necessarily take into account the informal sector um, of uh, much of the ICT ecosystem on the continent. Uh, and also on the nature of the disruptions, like I mentioned, some were geographic-based, some were app-based. Uh, so our study tried to fill that gap. Uh, since its launch, that framework has been very vital in informing campaigns and advocacy against uh, disruptions. Uh, it's demonstrated both actual loss for countries like Ethiopia and Cameroon that have, uh, for Ethiopia until reforms, but that have been legendary in terms of uh, disruptions, but also potential shutdowns uh, for countries like Kenya that are uh, leading in terms of ICT on the continent. Uh, that demonstrated loss or potential loss, we hope, has helped to rethink uh, decisions of disruptions. I think in Kenya and, and Ghana, we saw official proclamations of uh, shutting down the internet uh, during the elections that were held uh, last year and before that, but ultimately uh, the, the internet wasn't shut down, uh, which is a, a great thing. Uh, the automation of our framework by NetBlocks has, has also been significant in terms of uh, supporting uh, litigation and collaboration in research, but also ensuring that, you know, for the not necessarily mathematically adept activists or uh, um, pushback uh, stakeholders, they're able to get uh, data to support coverage and reporting uh, automatically. Uh, again, like Daniel mentioned, only uh, uh, in terms of demonstrating the impact of these disruptions has been instrumental in working with civil society. So ultimately, the framework and the work that we've done around disruptions has helped uh, strengthen pushback beyond activists and CSOs or think tanks like ourselves to include private sector and technologists. So yeah, multi-stakeholder. Great. Thank you, Ashna. Xian Hong? Thank you so much, Daniel, and it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm greatly imp impressed by our panel as well because uh, I learned a lot from all of you from different angle, different regional angle, and also some uh, statistics as well as uh, practice now. Uh, actually, you know, um, UNESCO has done a World Trans Report this year. We actually observe the same trend, worrying trend, that uh, such a significant increase of uh, all forms of blocking, filtering, internet shutdowns, and yeah, at the global level, uh, it can be really worrying because it has so many multiple implications. Certainly, it has massive economic and social consequences. And if you look at this through the UNESCO uh, position, as we have just uh, presented half an hour ago in the same room, we are advocating internet universality uh, worldwide. We are advocating internet to be human rights based, to be open to be accessible by all, to be driven by all the stakeholders. You will see it's just uh, impacting every dimension we are for. Uh, certainly, first of all, it's a huge access barrier to everybody. Um, secondly, on the human rights, certainly it's uh, really violating, uh, undermining freedom expression, undermining privacy and data protection, is undermining freedom association, and undermining the, I mean, eventually it's weakening the civil society. And also I'd like to point out that the, uh, the journalism and media, they are also very sensitive to this because imagine how internet is being so central for the journalism to have the source, to verify the news, and to protect their daily work. That's a really, really be a, such a barrier for the journalism to work to play their role for the democratic society and for the and informing the uh, civil society. And um, on the openness, I mean, beyond the human rights implication, we should also look at uh, the cost of this um, this unnecessary and not a proportional internet shutdown. Uh, um, 
activities. Imagine that uh, even uh, shutdown take place in one single country, and the rest part of the world wouldn't be able to access any information to this country and to know about these people from outside. It's, uh, it's literally I'm fragmenting the internet as a global public uh, resource. It really has such a profound impact, not only to the country per se, but also really to the global digital community. Um, so we are talking about uh, how we handle this. Certainly, I, again, I think everybody, I mean, all stakeholders have uh, shared responsibility to this. That's why we are advocating multi-stakeholder approach in the internet governance as one uh, uh, fourth pillar of the internet universality framework. Um, imagine the role of internet uh, IGOs, international organizations like UNESCO, we, has a, we have a role here to play. We need to hold our member states accountable and also to advocate the international standards, which has already been established uh, to be necessary and proportional and uh, human rights um, standards uh, as set up I set up in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and also uh, UN Human Rights Council has issued uh, several resolutions and uh, reports to um, tackle on this issue. And uh, certainly national governments should be um, engaged, I mean, certainly on this, and the uh, private sector and the technical communities, we are uh, also here to Find, uh, find out a technical solution. And again, I think the civil societies and academia I should not never be present uh, in this uh, uh, process. Um, we also, and I know when you talk about a multi-stakeholder approach, it, it tends to be generalized uh, at some point. But uh, we have also done a very in insightful uh, research to map the good practices of multi-stakeholderism uh, uh, at the national level to see how the uh, help uh, advance the human rights uh, at the national level. Uh, for example, in the past years, we have seen uh, increasing adoption of multi-stakeholder approach at uh, different uh, continents. It's not uh, limited here in Europe, but it really has gone beyond uh, the border of uh, the continent. Like in Kenya, many years ago, we have seen they have institutionalized the multi-stakeholder in, in the national um, policy-making process. It's called KICTNET. It's a network of all stakeholders to formulate the policy for the country. And in Asia, we knew that uh, some years ago in South Korea, when there was a constitutional um, uh, issue related to the real name registration, and then, then eventually it was replaced by a privacy and data protection policy, uh, thanks to the multi-participant stakeholder participation. Uh, again, of course, in Brazil, uh, the market civil is a, is a pioneer in human rights law, uh, thanks to the modest stakeholder mechanism in the in the in the country. So I, I do feel very optimistic in terms of using strengthening modest stakeholder approach in tackling as well the internet disruption issues at this moment. Great, thank you, Xian Hang. And I believe that we're gonna try again to connect with Kathleen. We'll see if her audio is working now. We'll give it just a moment. Hello, we can see you, Kathleen. But we can't hear you, unfortunately. Um, yeah, is there any other way that we could, uh, yeah, just w through WhatsApp and we'll hold it up to a microphone? Yeah. Okay, we're going to try that. Um, you know, I'm going to just uh, start posing a question that we're going to, I'm going to throw to the whole group after Kathleen talks, but just to give the, our speakers a chance to think about it, because one of the things, Osama, that you mentioned was the need for uh, more evidence to counter this. And when, when you first said that, I was thinking, well, you know, we have some really great initiatives that we've mentioned, NetBlocks, UNI, Access Now, et cetera. Um, and, but really, the type of evidence that you were talking about was a different type of evidence, right? Because in some ways we're, we're, we're really making strides in trying to track this and seeing where it's happening. 
but it's on the narrative side in terms of evidence of why it doesn't work and trying to convince the people who are doing this um, that, it, that they shouldn't do it, you know, that, uh, that their intent isn't being, it's not succeeding with these attempts. So I wanna, uh, the question is essentially, uh, what types of evidence, what would we look for, where do we need to go, what do we need to add to the base of evidence that we have that can facilitate more of the kind of multi-stakeholder, different parties coming together. So that's gonna be um, the question that I'm gonna pose to you. I'm hoping that we can get uh, Kathleen on the phone. Can you unmute no. yourself, Kathleen? We think that you no. might be muted. She's, she's not muted. She's not uh, muted, It's okay. the level of microphone in her side. Okay. You just need simply to uh, put your microphone level higher, Kathleen. So if you go to the audio menu there, uh, you can, in the audio connection, you can just okay. put your volume for your microphone higher. Okay. If you could do that, uh, we could hear you because you are well connected to audio. And we are uh, calling you right now on your on your cell phone. I mean, we can hear a very low um, sound from her side. Oh. Indeed. Hello. Everybody, uh, goodness me, this is how we defenders have to defend, you know, our ability to use resources um, in, in these parts. But thank you for your patience. My name is Kathleen. I am a digital rights defender. Um, I am also a businesswoman, so I own two con consultants in a business, and that actually leads me into really we go how we are affected by internet shutdown in in, in this part, especially in Cameroon, where I'm from. Um, I will delve into two angles because I'm sure that you know we're running out of time. But I really want to touch on the legislative and the economic uh, part of how multi-stakeholder uh, actors can actually play in ensuring that we keep the internet open. Um, if you have realized, Cameroon is, is a monarchy without really being a monarchy. Um, and in recent times, especially with the elections that just went by, we, we have, I mean, the world must have realized that our government is one that is keen on being seen as legitimate. And therefore, from the 90s, from the late 90s right up till now, they have enacted policy that are essentially made to stifle dissent um, and to hurt freedoms, especially freedom of speech online and off. And so for a government and for governments that are keen on being seen as legitimate, I believe that one of the most essential things that um, uh, multi-stakeholders of ourselves must begin to do is to uh, attack um, the creation of such uh, legislation or uh, to create, to fight to create our own legislation like in Nigeria where there's currently a digital rights and freedom bill that has been passed by uh, the House of Reps and the Senate and is currently waiting for pre the president's assent and you know activists are also pushing that through. Um, you can see the case of Uganda where the uh, excise duty act is what is being used to tax um, the VOT services. And in the case of Cameroon, where you have the cyber crime and cyber criminality 20, uh, 2010 law and the anti anti terrorism 2014 law, which are just broad uh, legislation to cap. Uh, 
um, the, the, their own ability to stifle the dissent. I think that one of the most important things that stakeholders need to start to look at is legislation. If we are working uh, against governments that are keen on being seen as legitimate, and I'll give you another example, the what we call in Cameroon the transparency debacle or the transparency gate, where even though Transparency International kept saying we did not send um, uh, observers to your election, the government and the spokespeople kept saying, especially the state media kept saying, these observers are from Transparency International. We need the voices and the actions and the tools and resources from every single actor to attack legislation. That's one. The second one for, for us is actually uh, the economic impact. So, um, like my, uh, my fellow activists from Uganda have, have said before, uh, CIPESA has done this really wonderful uh, report that really delves into the dynamics of uh, internet shutdowns and the impact in Africa in our own context. And it goes beyond just GDP. It goes right into health services. It goes right into small businesses and the impact that that has on a daily basis. So for example, in Cameroon, cost, uh, according to CIPESA, it costs about 1.7, uh, sorry, $1.6 million a day if you shut down the internet. And I think that it's important for us to look at um, how we can make the case to our government to tell them, you know what, you're creating policy to encourage a vibrant uh, internet digital economy, but you are also hurting yourself in the process by shutting down the internet. Um, and I think, you know, if we're able to uh, form coalitions, I'm actually a part of, I'm a member of something called NetRight, which is an African based uh, coalition of defenders of, of, of the internet or of digital freedoms. I think it's important for us to begin to work towards creating not just the tools but getting um, our partners to bring, bring forth these solutions. The last one I wanted to mention was the regional aspect, where very, we have the tendency of going further than we should. I think regional organizations have to be brought on board as well in, in order to get their own impact. Next door, Nigeria has an impact immediately. Cameroon starts getting into a crisis. Um, so, yeah. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. It was, uh, it was worth the technical trouble that we uh, did to get you, get you speaking. Oh, those were really great interventions. And uh, I'm going to now ask uh, Usama, and then anyone else afterwards can jump in to respond to the question that I asked. But I also think we can add um, to that some of the uh, solutions that Kathleen uh, talked about in terms of legislation and if we need to work on kind of regional multi-stakeholder efforts in order to, to uh, prompt uh, norms that will uh, prevent governments from taking these actions. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And yes, uh, when I spoke of evidence, uh, so yes, first we have evidence of the impact of network shutdowns and how that makes um, obviously life the economy and generally just the you know rights uh, scenario very difficult, but at the same time there also needs to be some f uh, sense of form of accountability uh, of the governments that are ordering these shutdowns. So, for example, uh, are they really achieving the objective that they claim? Uh, you know for the sake of security, we're shutting down networks in this area. But uh, w what is the evidence that this network shutdown is what makes us more secure? Or is it like other uh, practical steps that the government needs to take or like difficult decisions that the government needs to make in order to um, mitigate the impact that they're trying to you know, really uh, achieve? And then secondly, uh, there needs to be uh, greater transparency. So for example, has there been uh, incidents in the past where because of the avail availability of, say, mobile phone or internet networks, there was a security incidence? 
uh, incident that makes it more, you know, say proportional for the government to go ahead with network shutdowns in sensitive times. So I think it's this sort of uh, evidence that, you know, civil society and companies should demand of the government that really use this as like some sort of like, you know, divine intervention that they're bringing to us in order to make us secure. Um, I would like to um, um, think about it in another way as well. Um, well, by looking at uh, how we uh, operationalize multi-stakeholder approach uh, and to tackle the issue, as you have just said that you need evidence, we need the transparency. That's exactly why we need this sort of inclusive multi-stakeholder participation. Without uh, inclusive actors in the process, you wouldn't be able to really find the uh, evidence to give a comprehensive assessment of implication. It wouldn't be a, have a transparent uh, process. So, uh, so that's why we are really promoting this approach. In terms of how really we can get it, uh, I mean, it's not a cosmetic discussion. It's not uh, just to, to show sort of correctness, but uh, uh, having drawn the good practice and the challenges we have observed uh, the national state to adopt this approach. I mean, in our work, we have certainly identified some values, norms, we should have this mainstream to the, to the approach. Yeah, like inclusive, like to be diverse, collaborative, and transparent, and equal footing from different actors, and also to be relevant, etc. Uh, but on the other hand, I'd like to share our recent work about uh, how you can measure the the state call of the multi-stakeholder position in the national level because, again, we need the evidence-based approach to approach the multi-stakeholder approach. So, which means that, um, first of all, we should uh, look at uh, and assess the, what kind of legal and regulatory framework in the country to encourage, to allow for the multi-stakeholder approach to extent uh, this principle has been integrated and institutionalized by the government uh, at the national level, if they uh, like it's like in Kenya, they already have uh, uh, have it in their national <clears throat> framework to to you have to have this um, process uh, setting up before you make a policy. And uh, secondly, at the national level, I mean, in the uh, we are developing indicators to measure this law and also to measure the national level, the extent of participation. Um, it can, there can be many, many dimensions to look at, to examine. For example, is there active associations of the professionals in the country? Imagine if those technical people, engineers, and a different group, they, they should, first of all, they had join up into association. They have a voice among themselves before they can really uh, have impact to the policy process. And uh, imagine if the governments actively involve encouraging the different professional and association to be in the process. There are also many dimensions we have uh, taken stock from the past uh, experience. And uh, not only at the national level, I mean, again, I want to stress the global impact of any national uh, laws, actions in the internet. Uh, we also measure the international dimensions of multi-stakeholder participation. I mean, to what extent are national governments and the national stakeholders actively participating in the global discussion? I mean, for example, Internet IDF here. Yeah, it's a, it can be a very uh, interesting indicator to, to, if you look at the data, uh, to what extent every country participates in this forum and uh, to what extent they are representative from different uh, stakeholders ranging from government to private sector to civil society. They are involved here to contribute to, to the global discussion, to share their national experiences. So I think we, ha we can take a very scientific and also evidence-based approach to really advance the multi-stakeholder approach at the national level. Great, thank you. And uh, you know, another thing that uh, I'm really pleased that we have a representative from a telecommunications company, and I think it really shows how uh, this kind of movement against internet shutdowns is kind of broadening to other other stakeholders. And I was just wondering what the um, what the perspective of a telecommunications company is in terms of trying to build these. Uh, 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 
connections with other stakeholders because obviously it affects the bottom line of a telecommunications company when you have to deal with these special requests from companies. But what do you think the role of a telecommunications company would ideally be in this type of process? Well, what the multi-stakeholder process within and, and context within the GNI provides to Telia company is first uh, leverage where it's difficult for a single uh, operator in a country to say, hey, uh, don't force us to, to shut down uh, our, our, our subscribers and our, uh, and our business. Uh, we can build uh, uh, leverage within the GNI in the arguments, but also in the, in the specific issue that, uh, that is happening. Uh, the other one, of course, is uh, shared learning. Uh, where, where um, um, operators and internet companies are present in uh, various geographies around the world but meet the very same problems. So how did you deal with that there? And then uh, we learn from, uh, from each other. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, and I'm going to briefly open this up to questions. So if, if people have, I'm sure you actually have questions. So if we could go ahead and just take uh, we'll take three questions and then pass it over to uh, the panel. Um, we will uh, then have them respond. So, anyone have any questions? Okay, I see two hands over here, one hand right here. Okay. And please introduce yourself and your organization and country. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. I'm Ines. I'm one of the Open Internet for Democracy uh, Initiative fellows. Uh, I guess what I want to say, and Osama did mention it, sometimes not having internet shutdown can be a problem itself. Like we did, for example, a series with, uh, of interviews with activists in several countries, and activists in Oaxaca, Mexico, they did mention when they have rallies and protests, they didn't have internet shutdowns, and it was seen as a problem. As as a mass surveillance and because like during rallies and protests like for activists to show their environment who are they talking to who what are they saying and messages is more dangerous than not having internet at all i'm not saying by any means we should have internet shutdowns or internet is bad but i think the way we tackle the internet shutdowns we should not keep keep out like from our mind that we need to tackle it with protection of privacy and uh, how to tackle the, the surveillance Thank you. Hello, my name is Talal Azhar, and I'm from an organization called Media Matters for Democracy in Pakistan. And uh, I've seen that some countries have gone into litigation against these network shutdowns. And uh, I was interested to know if there is any network shutdown, uh, any litigation going on in Africa in your country, in Ashta. And I do know that there's uh, litigation going on in Pakistan. and. Uh, but how effective it is? Do you think a score has been effective? In, uh, do you think that the litigation against those network shutdowns been effective? Because I do know that we had a limited success in Pakistan, but the government has been shutting down internet on the basis of a mere legal stake. So how do you look at it? Um, hello, my name is Hannah Macklin, and I'm here with the NetBlocks group, uh, which was mentioned as an organization helping measure internet disruptions and online censorship. First, I'd just like to say it's great to see such a diverse panel uh, with organizations that we've worked with all over the world. Uh, uh, NetBlocks firmly believes in order to have this type of conversation and create these type of solutions, we really need to have a diverse set of voices approaching it. Um, so I was wondering if some of the panelists um, could share some of the successes of having a multi-stakeholder approach to tackling internet shutdowns um, regionally. Um, uh, NetBlocks, what we've tried to do is also have more of a creative approach to try to create some impact um, in terms of tackling these shutdowns. Um, we're working with CPESA, for example, on our tool called COST, which looks at the economic impact of these shutdowns, which I believe was mentioned by a couple of the panelists. So we're trying to uh, create our multi-stakeholder approach that way, and it would be interesting to see uh, how the other panelists and organizations are also doing that as well. Thank you. Great, thank you. So we have, we have three questions here. Uh, the first is the uh, relationship between uh, uh, mass surveillance and how we deal with that in terms of internet. 
uh, when we're thinking about shutdowns, what, what happens in a case when it's safer for activists to not be surveilled. Uh, then we have the second question about litigation, specifically is there any litigation in Africa or also is there any litigation perhaps dealing with the, the telecommunications companies or in other places that um, has that has that been effective or um, is that uh, not a venue for this type of action? And then the third is um, thinking about some successes and maybe they, you know, what, whatever kind of level of success you would judge that as. Very tough questions, uh, all of them. Um, I just uh, share a, a few thoughts for me. Uh, first, on the mass surveillance, you know, it's a <clears throat> it has been an issue for so many years. Um, it's a matter of privacy. That's why I mean UNESCO has taken a new task since 2015. To we used to defend the free expression as our core mandate. But um, with the privacy became so crucial and um, the, the surveillance issue come up in from 2013, we, we, we realized that uh, you have to defend all the human rights in an indivisible way, in a comprehensive frame framework, because on internet all the rights are converged. Basically, if you don't have safety and privacy and uh, security from from ref to refrain from being surveilled. I mean, nobody can really free speak, express, or practice any expression on the internet. That's why from this angle, we are really taking the stand to protect both free expression and privacy. I think they are all related to what we're talking today. And uh, the, that's a complexity here as well, because uh, then the surveillance, in many cases, they were conducted for the concern of national security. I mean, with many other reasons, whether legitimate or maybe less. Uh, so we need a really a broader framework to look at all the rights and the, I mean, the trade-offs. And also beyond, go beyond the rights, I mean, how they are really impacting internet, the internet as a, as a whole. You don't want to kill the internet by defending certain rights rather than you, you, you eventually lose, you're losing this internet uh, platform for human society. So that's, so that's how we are looking at it in a, with a broader frame of universality frameworks. And uh, good practice. And also that's why, because complex, because all related, we, we think multidisciplinary is really a, a direction we, we are going to. You asked me about a good practice. We well, have seen some good practice in the past to handle the human rights related issues. But in terms of internet shutdown, I'm not uh, aware of the recent uh, development, uh, but I heard that uh, in maybe our remote participate uh, in Cameroon, I heard that some initiatives there to try to get uh, multi multi multiple participation from different actors to, to work towards that direction. But I think uh, that should be a direction. But on the other hand, uh, my observation, my personal ob observation that um, the, the discussion, and uh, very often you find there's many missing from certain actors, some key actors can be uh, completely missing from the discussion. Sometimes it's a government. It's just, um, I saw a report about the ITF saying that uh, since the less, um, that's a decreasing interest of the government to participate in this forum. Sometimes, I mean, you see the private sector is not included. I mean, as again, in many, I mean, in, in, in my working context, uh, I found in some uh, international organizations events, I, I saw there are not uh, so many um, particip from, uh, participation from civil society. So that's really, I, I, I would say I see more challenges and gaps. Uh, that's exactly why the process is still not perfect. Far from that, we need to strengthen it so that uh, we can have our uh, good practice maybe in the near future to tackle this uh, internet shutdown issue. Um, so to respond to the question on litigation and uh, its effectiveness, um, broadly around uh, digital rights or uh, challenging government policies and practices uh, that curtail freedom of expression and privacy and other rights on the continent, litigation has proved to be a useful tool in, in challenging those uh, uh, bad practices. 
there have been cases uh, initiated in Uganda, Cameroon, and I believe Gabon as well, uh, against shutdowns. Unfortunately, um, like many legal processes, uh, it's frustrating, it's long. Uh, I believe in the case for Cameroon, uh, there's been deliberate efforts to uh, stall or frustrate the process, court papers going missing and uh, dates constantly being adjourned. I think the case for Uganda that was had yesterday, <coughs> I think from two years ago when it was filed, it's been adjourned till uh, February of next year. So the process is proving really frustrating and there hasn't been any successes specific to disruptions. But for other rights uh, on online, there's been successes recorded in uh, Gabon and in Burundi where there's been challenges against uh, provisions on freedom of expression online, uh, defamation and criminal libel. So those have at least set precedent and there's uh, opportunities for uh, stakeholders to work together during uh, some of these cases where amicus have been filed uh, jointly with civil society and uh, private sector and those being backed up by uh, wider advocacy efforts. So there is potential, uh, but specifically to disruptions, there hasn't been any successes yet. So, um, First of all, thanks everybody for organizing, uh, for, for joining us late in the day today. <laughs> I know we're close to out of time. I just want to mention a few things responding to the, the questions that have been posed. Um, I think, uh, as Patrick mentioned, uh, we first started talking about this issue at the IGF um, in a workshop in 2016 in Guadalajara. And at that time, I think there was, um, uh, there were gaps in the understanding between how uh, NGOs and civil society perceived uh, network shutdowns and how companies perceived how NGOs and other uh, stakeholders were thinking about shutdowns and that we've been able to sort of um, raise the level of understanding among stakeholders who are really committed to this issue and to foster collaboration. Um, we created this one pager and now we have it in many different uh, translations. Um, uh, there was uh, initial economic research that was done and other organizations like SUPESA have now taken that and improved upon it and given us more detailed regional specific research that's out there. Um, we, uh, G as GNI, uh, co-organized together with UNESCO a colloquium on elections and ICT that looked at this issue of uh, disruptions and shutdowns in February of this past year. Uh, and um, colleagues from Internet Sans Frontières, working together with colleagues in Cameroon, were able to um, uh, adapt that kind of colloquium and, and uh, organize it at the local level in Cameroon earlier this year. So there's been real successes and, and examples of you know concrete collaboration between states stakeholders uh, on this issue within the internet policy and internet governance and digital rights space um, that is very encouraging and I think gives us a good base to build from. Um, but I think when we think about how else do we get this issue in front of policymakers in governments who are the ones making the decisions to order a disruption or a shutdown, we need to go beyond just the ICT sector. And there I think we have a lot more work to do. Um, just to share one rather sobering anecdote, um, so GNI, together with the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, uh, recognized this need to try to uh, reach out to stakeholders um, in other industries, uh, for example, who are affected by um, sh internet shutdowns and disruptions. Uh, we wrote to, I think, 20 multinational companies um, from sectors like the extractive industry and banking and agriculture um, that are operating in Cameroon. Uh, last year uh, to seek their assistance uh, uh, working with us um, on this issue and to get, try to get those types of companies involved. We didn't get a single reply. Um, so um, we have a lot of work to do, but I think the type of collaboration that we've been able to engender within the digital rights community is something that we can expand uh, across um, because this kind of uh, uh, disruption is so <laughs> disproportionate uh, in its impact. It affects all of society. Uh, you know, the impacts go well beyond what we have in our one pager. And I think that, um, that collectively, um, there's a lot more that we can do to bring in other groups. So I'm excited to work with organizations who work, for example, with local chambers of commerce, with local media development organizations uh, and others, including many of the groups active in the open internet um, coalition 
uh, to try to uh, take this forward. So um, I know we're close to time, or maybe we're even over time, but uh, it would be great to hear if the, uh, our uh, panelists have any uh, last ideas in terms of solutions. Uh, <laughs> Modest declarism. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Um, just, I think a lot of the questions I've been uh, uh, dealt with, but I think your point about mass surveillance is very, very important, and that's something that we see a lot during protests. Uh, it's because, A, media is heavily censored in a lot of uh, countries, including in Pakistan, so social media is the only avenue that people have for dissent and political speech. Uh, but then either that is disrupted or if it's not disrupted, then there's heavy surveillance. Uh, so that does become a huge issue. Um, and that's something that we as an organization work on with uh, human rights defenders is we do um, uh, detailed digital security trainings with them in order to you know, try to equip them with tools to, so that they can protect their digital presence as much as possible. Obviously, there's no like uh, foolproof way. Um, and just talking about litigation, so Yatala, like you mentioned, in Pakistan, there's been cases where then the government gets a stay order, and you know, two weeks ago, we've had network uh, shutdowns, even though the high court had ordered a suspension of that. Um, and just hitting back at multi-stakeholder successes, so yes, I think NetBlocks does amazing work, and I think we collaborated also in a, on a few projects. Um, so I don't have a particular example on network shutdowns, but in Pakistan, in the past, for example, in multi stakeholder campaigns, we wrote to uh, companies that were selling surveillance technology to the Pakistani government. And we got around five companies to commit to not sell that technology to the government. And I think GNI played a very helpful role in that network, in, in that uh, campaign. So there is some sort of success. And secondly, in Pakistan, when we were, uh, you know, trying to campaign against the cyber crime bill, uh, what we saw was that we were able to get through to policymakers a lot better when we went as a, what we call a joint action committee. So that included uh, the IT business community, which is pretty huge in Pakistan, as well as telecom operators, uh, civil society, and academia and media. Uh, so I think all of us working together were able all of us were able to get a seat in, say, the National Assembly Committees in IT um, and in other uh, in the Senate as well. So I think that way you have a bet better chance of being heard rather than acting alone. So I think even for network disruptions, that certainly is the way to go forward. Thank you. Just to add one thing, the issue that you raised here on, on, uh, on safety of, of uh, people uh, locally, uh, of course, also very much applies to colleagues, uh, employees of the telco locally. So therefore, uh, it has proven to be very important to have a policy within the group which says that if there is an un unconventional request, for example, for shutdowns locally, that the local company is required to escalate that within the group. That way you take away the pressure from the people, employees that are mm. just like other people locally uh, might be harassed or under pressure or in a very difficult position. Um, so in terms of um, how to move forward, let's saw the word solutions, uh, I think, uh, Maintaining the amount of stakeholder approach is important, but we need to get innovative. Um, I think in as much as shutdowns are increasingly prevalent in sub-Saharan Africa, the governments have also become innovative. Uh, we're seeing more economic-based upfronts to access and use of the internet, uh, social media taxes. It costs five cents a day to use WhatsApp, Facebook, and Twitter in Uganda. Uh, there are mobile, transa mobile money transaction taxes imposed on sending and receiving uh, money. Uh, online content regulations in Tanzania require registration and voice over IP levies in, in Zambia. Obviously, those scenarios, in addition to disruptions, are a huge uh, barrier to access and affordability and uh, human rights, but also have significant economic implications on the potential of ICT on the continent. So avenues and approaches that uh, capture economic impact, as well as human rights uh, aspects and encourage cooperation channels are extremely vital. I think one of the ones that we at CIPESA are increasingly exploring and want to push more to activists is the use of the UPR, 
mechanism to uh, push more on internet freedom issues uh, since uh, it's more focused on traditional human rights. Great, thank you, Ashna, and thank you all the panelists. Unfortunately, for technical reasons, we're not gonna be able to hear from Kathleen, although we very, very much appreciated her comments. Uh, they were very uh, useful. Um, I just wanna, uh, I, I, I want to echo what uh, David said, um, and I think that the GNI can take pride in a lot of the work that they've done around trying to mobilize this and get different groups on the same uh, page and trying to develop greater leverage. And I wanted to mention that the Open Internet for Democracy project, we're building an advocacy playbook that some of the fellows here have been working on. And one of the scenarios that we want to empower democracy activists to be able to do is to respond to internet disruptions and internet shutdowns. And so uh, this is being, it's in the kind of iteration process of being created. So we would invite everyone who's interested to uh, contact me or contact someone else on the project because we'd like to kind of collect some of this knowledge and get it into hands of people who um, aren't in these kind of digital rights spaces who may not know the best practices when, when a shutdown happens in, in their country. Um, so I think that uh, summing up, you know, we've come a long way. We have great measurement tools. There's a greater understanding of some of the impacts of these disruptions, but there's a long way to go, especially about increasing this to get it beyond the digital rights and beyond the ICT sector. So uh, without further ado, thank you everyone for staying this late and we really appreciate it. And thank you to the IGF staff and the uh, transcribers. Thank you. <laughs>